Adolf Hitler ended his life on April 30th and Berlin fell on May 2nd. But did you know that the German unconditional surrender was on May 8th? It was the time that Germany was led by Hitler's successor. I'm talking about the second Führer of the German Reich, Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz. Who? In this video, I will talk about the short-lived Flensburg government. It was the last government of the Third Reich under Karl Dönitz. So let's go back to Berlin on the 20th of April. Adolf Hitler comes out for a last time. He leaves his bunker to hand out some decoration to boy soldiers that have proved bravely in the struggle against the Russians that were now inside the Reich's capital. Ten days later, Hitler committed suicide. Now, he had made up his last will in which he appointed Karl Dönitz to be his successor. But why Dönitz? Why not somebody else? It was partially because he did not trust anyone from his own circle any longer. Göring and Himmler had fallen into disgrace and Goebbels was willing to go down with him. Karl Dönitz had proved loyal to Hitler and had also waged an effective U-boat campaign during the war. The new government of the Reich was seated in the north of Germany, a city called Flensburg near the Danish border. This city wasn't bombed by the Allies and here the top ranking Nazis could go to to yeah, do what actually? Because by now the situation for Germany was disastrous to say the least. The capital had fallen and the Reich was split in two by the Soviets and the Western Allies. The Dönitz government was only a part of what Hitler appointed. Dönitz learned that Bormann, Goebbels and Sazenquart, the Reichskommissars of occupied Netherlands, had to become ministers. Bormann and Goebbels were dead and Sazenquart was negotiating with the Allies for surrendering the Netherlands. Dönitz later stated that this new cabinet was apolitical. Apolitical? Well, no, since many high-ranking SS members as well as war criminals went to Flensburg. Himmler wanted to be part of the new government but was excluded. Also because he had betrayed Hitler since he, in the latter stages, tried to seek reproachment with the Western Allies. Dönitz broke relations with Himmler, after which the once so mighty and feared SS police chief went into hiding. He was eventually captured by the Allies and swallowed a poison capsule and that was the end of him. Minister of Armaments Albert Speer, I spoke about him extensively in a previous video, was back at it again. Supreme Commander of the Wehrmacht laid in the hands of Field Marshal Keitel and Colonel General Jodl. Leading minister became Lutz Graf Schwerin von Kosig, from origin a conservative who served as Minister of Finances in the years till May 1945. In the weeks prior to Hitler's suicide, he had showed interest in becoming a part of the new government. Existing structures of power were maintained. The portrait of Hitler was still in the office, the Hitler salute was still being used, and even flying court marshals were still exercising their duty and condemning suspected deserters to death even after the unconditional surrender of Germany this still happened. So what was the goal of this Flensburg government? Well, their goal was buying time. See, they wanted to avoid an unconditional surrender and they used occupied Denmark and largely occupied Norway as bargaining chips. Also, they wanted to divide the Allies by pointing out to the Western Allies that they once might need the Germans to fight against the Soviets. So why did they want to avoid an unconditional surrender? I mean, the situation was practically lost, right? Well, yeah, but at the moment when an unconditional surrender goes into effect, all troops have to stay at their current position. And that would mean that millions of German troops would fall into the hands of the Soviets. And on May 2nd, Dönitz pointed out the following. The only policy was to try to negotiate a series of partial surrenders in the West while continuing the fight in the East. 
at least until as many Germans as possible, soldiers and civilians, could be rescued from the clutches of the Soviets. And as Dönitz himself stated in a post-war interview, Menschen, deutsche Menschen von Ost nach West zu retten. From early 1945, the Soviets were overrunning the German homeland, starting with the invasion of East Prussia. After an early incursion, which occurred in the autumn of 1944, we already saw the vengeance of the Red Army when they slaughtered over 20 German civilians at the village of Nemesdorf. These atrocities were continued after their full-scale invasion that kicked off January 1945. This vengeance was caused by the German brutality that kicked off after their invasion from June 1941. It was a war of extermination the Germans had fought and now civilians and soldiers knew they could expect no mercy from Red Army soldiers. By that time, Eastern Germans tried to make their way through the freezing cold to the port cities of Pilau and Gotenhafen. Till the last moment, the German soldiers fought off the Soviets at these cities to make these evacuations happen. Also, one of the goals of the Flensburg government was to try their soldiers to surrender to the Western Allies instead of the Soviets. So was this a success? Well, let's take a look at the numbers. Out of the 10 million German soldiers that were in the field near the end of the Second World War, only 30% ended up in Soviet captivities. And this can be considered quite a success since over three quarters of the German army had fought on the Eastern Front. So now you may argue, well, this Dönitz guy, well, he was quite of a noble man, wasn't he? Well, as it turned out, the evacuation of military personnel was favored over civilians. Only at the 6th of May 1945, Dönitz forbade the systematic destruction of German factories and infrastructure. And this stopped the scorched earth policy that was initiated by Hitler in March 45. As Ian Kershaw wrote, Dönitz, as we have seen, had endeavored to postpone the inevitable defeat as long as possible through a series of partial surrenders calculated to find time to bring back the troops and, as a much lower priority, civilians from the east and also in the hope, if rapidly fading, that even now the wartime condition of the Western powers and the Soviet Union might crack. The strategy was largely, if not totally, a failure and at a high cost. Right, and if Dönitz's goal was to save as many German soldiers and civilians as possible, why didn't he just open up the Western Front and let the Western Allies advance as much as possible in order to shorten the lines for the German troops so they could fall into the hands of the Western Allies instead of the Soviets. Yet, Dönitz's sense of military honor and also his belief in National Socialism prevented him from doing that. Sie haben auch mal in einer Rede gesagt, durchsetzt von dem auflösenden Gift des Judentums werden wir längst der Belastung dieses Krieges erlegen wenn der Führer uns nicht im Nationalsozialismus geeint hätte. Ich war insofern kein überzeugter Antisemit, weil ich bei der Kriegsmarine als Oberbefehlshaber der Kriegsmarine nicht das geringste Unrecht geduldet habe gegen einen Mann, der jüdische Abstammung oder jüdisch verheiratet war. The Flensburg government remained on his post till the 23rd of May. In a surreal atmosphere, they continued to function as a government with cabinet meetings where they discussed the new national flag and the rebuilding of the country. Each morning at 10 o'clock, they had a meeting in an old school building. Keitel remained head of the Wehrmacht until his arrest on the 13th of May, when Jodl took it over. 
This pantomime of a rump government did not held out long. On the 23rd of May, the Allies summoned the leaders of this rump government. American Major General Lowell W. Rooks read a prepared text. I am under the instructions to tell you that the Supreme Commander General Eisenhower has decided in concert with the Soviet High Command that today the acting German government and the German High Command shall be taken into custody with several members as prisoners of war. Thereby, the acting German government is dissolved. The Third Reich had now come to its definitive end. Von Kosich was convicted of war crimes and sentenced to 10 years in prison, commuted in 1951. Keitel was found guilty on war crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, criminal conspiracy and war crimes and sentenced to death. Jodl was sentenced to death as well for charges of conspiracy to commit crimes against peace, planning, initiating and waging wars of aggression war crimes and crimes against humanity. Speer was found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity, principally for the use of slave labor. Speer was released in 1966. And Dönitz was found guilty on committing crimes against peace and war crimes against the laws of war. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Thanks to my patrons you see on screen and a special thanks to Henry Clarkson and One Bad Cookie. If you want to support me, go to the link right here. If you want to learn more about the end of the Eastern Front, you click right here. And if you want to learn more about the end of the Western Front, you click right here. Thank you so much for watching. That was it for now. Do subscribe and I'll see you guys later.